In this video, we'll go over the basic structure of the bipolar junction transistor, the BJT, and its operation in active mode. The two basic types of bipolar junction transistors are shown here. As you can see, they both consist of back-to-back -back PN junctions. On the left, we see the NPN BJT, so named because it consists of a sandwich of N-type, P-type, and N-type doped semiconductor layers. The three terminals are called the emitter, base, and collector. The base terminal serves as the control terminal. Similar to other transistor types, the voltage on the base will regulate the current flow through the other two terminals. That's the basic transistor action. The other basic type of BJT is the PNP type shown here on the right. This is again a sandwich of differently doped semiconductor layers, but in this case, the sandwich is P, N, and P. The base terminal is still the one in the middle, and again, it serves as a control regulating the current flow through the other two terminals. To understand how the BJT operates, it's worthwhile to remind ourselves the basics of PN junction operation. Here we see a basic PN junction. Remember that if it were open circuited, then the PN junction would arrive at a steady state where diffusion from P to N type and N to P type will give rise to a depletion region across which an electric field develops so that further diffusion of charge carriers is opposed by drift current in the opposite direction. In this case though, a forward we see a forward voltage applied VF. That voltage lowers the barrier to diffusion currents and gives rise to additional, allowing additional diffusion to occur from the P-type to the N-type, that is holes, will appear by diffusion in the N-type region over here as excess minority carriers and vice versa. Some electrons will diffuse from the N-type to the P-type region and appear as excess minority carriers in the P-type region. Now in this particular PN junction that's pictured, the P region is more heavily doped than the N region. So the number of holes and concentration of minority holes that arrive by diffusion in the N-type region is much larger than the number of electrons that arrive as minority carriers in the p-type region. Remember then that because of the excess minority carrier concentration at this point here in the n-type junction, they will those excess minority carriers will diffuse from left to right from areas of higher concentration to lower concentration, recombining with the majority electrons as they go, giving rise to a concentration profile like this and uh, ultimately reaching this steady state value that represents the thermal equilibrium of this n-type doped silicon. On the left, the similar process occurs in the p-type region where excess minority electrons diffuse from right to left deeper into the p-type region, recombining as they go. But again, because the n-type region here is more lightly doped in this example, then it so happens there's a lower concentration uh, over here on the left. So there's less current arising due to electrons than there are due to holes. Over here on the right, we've got the picture when a reverse bias voltage is applied. In this case, the depletion region grows even further. Diffusion is opposed so that there's almost no diffusion arising from P to N of holes and from N to P of electrons. And the only carrier that remains is a small drift current that flows reverse through the PN junction. This is thought of as a leakage in a normal diode. And it arises because any minority carriers that arise, uh, that arrive at the edge of the depletion region are swept across the depletion region by the electric field to the opposing terminal and show up as a reverse current. So excess electrons, uh, sorry, excess minority holes that arrive here are swept by the electric field to this terminal. Excess minority electrons that arrive here from the P-type region are swept over here. So electron, uh, electrons flowing from left to right, 
and holes flowing from right to left give rise to a net positive current flowing in the reverse direction through the PN junction. So just a reminder that majority carriers are electrons in the n-type region, and they're not uh, swept to the other side by the electric field, right? Actually, the electric field tends to keep the electrons over here. It's only the minority carriers that arise at either end of the depletion region that are swept across it and show up as reverse current through the reverse bias junction. So remembering these two behaviors, now we're ready to consider what happens when we put two junctions in very close proximity to each other, as we see in the BJT. So here we have a cartoon cross-section of a BJT. And this particular one is a type PNP BJT. And so we've got a PN junction formed here. Again, we've assumed that the P side of the PN junction is more heavily doped than the N side of this PN junction. And a forward bias voltage VF is applied so that we see the uh, large diffusion current flowing across the PN junction, giving rise to excess minority electrons here and excess minority holes in the N type region. Now, again, since the P type region is more heavily doped than the concentration of holes that arrive over here in the N type region is much larger than the concentration of electrons that arrive in the p-type region. So of this diffusion current, the vast majority of it is carried by the more heavily doped charge carrier type. That is, most of it in this case is carried by holes that arrive in the n-type region as minority carriers. Now we know once they arrive here, they should continue by diffusion from areas of higher concentration to lower concentration recombining as they go. That would be the case if this n-type region extended indefinitely. But in the case of a BJT, it doesn't. In very close proximity to this junction, we place another PN junction pointing in the other direction. And in its normal active mode of operation, we reverse bias this PN junction. The reverse bias voltage, VR, gives rise to a reverse electric field across this PN junction, as shown here. And remember that for a reverse bias PN junction, any minority carriers that arrive at the edge of the depletion region here, in this case it would be holes arriving at that edge of the n-type region, will be swept by the electric field across to the p-type region. So what it means is that rather than the usual picture that we're used to from the last slide, instead, the carrier concentration at the edge of the depletion region of holes must in fact be very, very low, zero. So instead of the usual decaying profile here, we instead see a straight line profile or very close to it where we get a steady stream of diffusion from areas of higher concentration to lower concentration, proportional to the slope of holes from left to right across this n-type region. And those holes, once they arrive there, are swept across the second reverse bias depletion region and collected at this terminal here. So the vast majority of this current flows all the way through to this terminal rather than flowing out through the contact to the n-type terminal. That's why we call this terminal the collector. The base terminal is this control terminal. Effectively, it's the voltage between the base and emitter terminal that regulates the number of holes that show up here and thus the diffusion current that's ultimately collected at the collector. So it's the base emitter voltage, in this case set by VF, that determines the current that flows from emitter to collector. So that's just a quick overview of the basic operation of, in this case, a PNP transistor. Um, we'll go into more details on it in subsequent slides, but already you see the basics of the three terminal operation of this device, where the base voltage is controlling the current flowing through the other two terminals, the emitter and the collector.
So here we see the PNP BJT again. And now we can understand why it's called a bipolar junction transistor. It's because there's two junctions with two different polarities. And of course, it's a transistor because it's a three terminal device with this transistor action where the voltage on the base controls the current through the other two terminals. We've got the semiconductor sandwich formed, P, N, and P type in this case. But we also need metal contacts to uh, each of the three regions separately. And they're labeled here E for emitter, B for base, and C for collector. So just to note, these cartoon cross sections are useful for understanding the basic operation of the BJT. But later we'll see how the actual physical structure is not a simple rectangular block like this. Um, but in any case, the current flow is best understood with this sort of one dimensional model. Now clearly to activate the PNP type transistor, we have to forward bias the emitter base junction, which means that we have to pull the base voltage below the voltage at the emitter in order to forward bias this junction. And we need to reverse bias the collector base junction, which means the collector has to be at an even lower voltage than the base. Here's the NPN BJT. Again, we've got an emitter metal contact in the n-type region on the left, base contact here, collector contact on the right, and the transistor is activated by forward biasing the emitter base junction. But in this case, forward biasing it means putting the base voltage higher than the emitter voltage. And to have it operate in active mode, the collector base junction needs to be reverse biased, which means the collector needs to be at an even higher voltage than the base. So that's why we really need two types of BJT, the PNP and the NPN. One is activated with a positive base emitter voltage. One is activated with a negative base emitter voltage. So here again is the NPN BJT pictured now in active mode with the appropriate polarity of bias voltages applied and labeling the different currents flowing through the transistor. So you'll notice the base emitter voltage VBE is applied with a polarity that will forward bias the base emitter junction. So with that forward bias applied, we're going to get some electrons diffusing across the junction and injected into the base. And we've also got some holes from the base diffusing across the junction and injected into the emitter. Now the BJT is constructed so that the emitter region is much more heavily doped than the base region, so that the concentration of injected electrons is much higher than the concentration of injected holes. Now remember, the injected electrons that arrive here in the base region should, uh, for proper operation of the transistor, mostly diffuse all the way across the base region and be collected by the collector, because really we want most of the current flowing between these two terminals. The idea is the base is just a control terminal where we apply a voltage to regulate the current that's flowing this way. So a properly engineered BJT would not only have a heavily doped emitter region, but also have a very narrow base region so that all, pretty much all or a very large fraction of the injected electrons end up being collected by the reverse biased collector base junction. And here we've got a nice healthy reverse bias voltage applied. Uh, here. Now, in spite of all your best efforts, there will still be some small fraction of those injected electrons into the base that as they're diffusing, even if the base region is very, very narrow, some of them will recombine with the majority holes that uh, live in the base region. Now, after recombination, those holes that disappear have to be replaced and they are replaced by a small trickle of current flowing into the base. So there's not zero current flowing into the base. If you're thinking 
of it by analogy to the gate in a MOSFET, you'll recognize a different, an important difference here. Whereas there's no current, no DC current flowing into the gate of a MOSFET, a small current is re required to flow into the base to keep it on. And that current is partly being used to replace the holes that recombined with some of these excess electrons as they diffuse across. Another portion of the base current, however, is required to provide the small number of holes that are injected into the emitter region. These holes injected into the emitter encounter a very heavy concentration of electrons. Remember that the emitter region is heavily doped. So they do quickly recombine. So as a result, um, that current all has to come from the base, right? All those injected holes have to be replaced by this current IB. So there's two components to the base current in summary, right? There's the holes that are injected into the emitter and recombine there. And then there's the small fraction of diffusing electrons that recombine uh, that also uh, have to be provided by base current. So IB1 and IB2 added together give the total base current IB. In this case, um, that means holes flowing into the p-type region, so that means net positive current flowing into the base. Now, the vast majority of the in electrons ejected from the emitter diffuse through the base and they're collected in the collector region and then uh, pass out the collector terminal to keep the concentration of electrons here at its thermal equilibrium value once the device has reached its steady state. So electrons flowing out this way implies a net positive current flowing this way into the collector. But again, the amount of current flowing there is primarily due to these diffusing electrons that are uh, injected from the emitter. And so that amount of current is determined by the base emitter voltage. All that's required is some reverse bias between collector and base to ensure that those carriers are, are collected. The current that flows there doesn't depend very much on the value of that reverse bias voltage. Here we've got another cartoon of the NPN BJT. Again, here's the base, here's the emitter, and here's the collector. For operation in active mode, we've got to apply forward bias between the base and emitter. And with, as with any silicon PN junction, you know, we need a forward voltage there of between 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 volts to um, give rise to appreciable current flowing across this emitter base junction. So we'll label that VBE as before. And then we need a reverse bias voltage maintained between collector and base. So um, in this picture here, we've shown the carrier, the minority carrier concentrations along the same axis. So in the depletion region, um, we see no uh, we see no carriers, no free carriers. And then uh, in the p-type side, we have an excess of minority electrons that are injected from the emitter due to the forward bias there. So that uh, excess has to drop all the way to zero at the edge of the collector base junction depletion region. So um, with no recombination of carriers, then we would expect the, all the diffusion current here to be showing up here. So we've got, we would have in steady state then the same amount of current density flowing all across the base region. Since diffusion current is proportional to the slope of the carrier concentration, then we would expect a constant slope all the way across the base region. Um, and again, that would be the case if all the minority electrons that arrive over here in the base, if they all diffused all the way to the collector and were collected. But because that's not quite the case, there's going to be some finite 
uh, recombination as they go along. Uh, that gives rise to some finite base current. We don't want that. We want to minimize that. So this cartoon is obviously not to scale. The base region would be quite uh, narrow to avoid this, but inevitably there will be some recombination, which means that instead we get a picture, a carrier, a minority carrier concentration profile, more like the dashed line, where the diffusion current proportional to the slope is larger here, but some of that current never shows up at the collector. So the slope here is slightly less. The difference between the diffusion current at the left edge of the base region at the right edge of the base region, that difference um, in electron uh, flow is uh, gives rise to a finite base current. So some, the missing electrons, if you like, would be flowing out the base, which implies positive current flow into the base. And as we said, that's one source of base current. The other source of base current is the excess holes that are injected across the forward bias emitter base junction um and you know recombine as they uh, diffuse deeper into the emitter region so um this is the other portion of base current here so the distance between the edge of the emitter base depletion region and collector base depletion region is the effective base width w so the concentration of minority carriers that shows up here depends on the forward bias voltage VBE, but the slope of this curve also depends on the base width W. If we can make a very, very narrow base width, then this slope becomes very steep and we get more current flowing here. Effectively, the excess minority carriers that are showing up here diffuse faster and faster as the base width is made narrow, narrower and narrower, and so have to be replaced faster and faster by more um, minority carriers, and so that gives rise to more current flow. So you see that the current flow in the BJT depends on the concentration of minority carriers that arrives here, which in turn depends on the forward bias voltage applied between base and emitter and the carrier concentration in the emitter. If we can make this carrier concentration higher, we're gonna get more minority carriers are gonna appear in the base. And also depends on the width of the depletion region, narrower width of the, of the uh, sorry, of the base region, narrower width is gonna also mean more current. Again, the current is only a weak function of the reverse bias applied between collector and base. It does depend slightly on that reverse bias voltage. For example, when the reverse bias voltage is increased, the collector base depletion region will get wider and encroach more in the base region and make the effective base width smaller, which in turn will make this slope steeper and give rise to a little extra current. But that's a relatively weak effect that we'll discuss later. So we've discussed the BJT operation qualitatively quite a bit now. It's time to put some equations to this and allow us to do some calculations on current flows and uh, create some model of operation for the BJT. So we've seen that the current flow between uh, emitter and collector is dominated by these injected electrons, which uh, whose concentration is a function of the base emitter voltage. In fact, it's the same function as it is in just a regular PN junction. And we've already seen that uh, expression in our analysis of diodes. It's an exponential um, function of VBE. Uh, specifically, we've got this term VT over here. Remember that VT equals kt over q, the so-called thermal voltage, it's about 25 millivolts at room temperature. So we've got that classic exponential relationship just like we have in a diode, and then we've got this scale current IS. So what does the scale current IS depend on? Well, 
um, clearly all else being equal, the more cross-sectional area we have here, I mean, imagine I'm kind of drawing into the screen here, and you got a cross-sectional area for this emitter base junction A E. So if you double that cross-sectional area, then all of these um, current flows will just be will just be doubled. So the scale current I S therefore is proportional to the area there. It's also proportional to the rate of diffusion in the PN, uh, in the P type base region. So it has uh, terms that are very much like the diffusion, that, that are very much like any diffusion current in, in dope semiconductors. So that's why we see the diffusion constant showing up here. And then we've also got a term here that depends on the dopant concentrations and therefore on the uh, concentration of minority carriers that uh, arises here in the base. And then finally, the scale current is inversely proportional to the base region width. Because as we said, if we have a narrower base width, W gets smaller, we're going to see more diffusion current flowing uh, into the collector. So, uh, and then finally, we've just got the fundamental electronic charge Q uh, to give this, you know, if you like, units of uh, coulombs per second. So, you know, rather than derive that expression, I think it's more worthwhile to understand all the terms in there and, and how each of them. Uh, makes sense. Now these expressions um, describe the total current that flows to the collectors. In the case of an NPN transistor, those are electrons flowing out the collector, which means positive current flowing into the collector. Um, the polarities are reversed for the PNP type, BJP. For the base current, we just know that um, some small, hopefully small, for a properly engineered BJT, fraction of that current um, ends up being lost to the base because of recombination, as well as because of some injected holes. Now, the fraction, the number of holes injected uh, across the forward bias base emitter junction is also proportional to VBE, to, to E to the power of VBE over VT, I should say. So it's also uh, related, it's, an, it's a sort of scalar multiple of IC, right? It has a form very similar to this, but just with a much smaller value of IS. And likewise, um, the fraction of electrons that are recombined also has a form just like this, but with a much smaller value of IS. So instead we just express the base current It's most convenient to express it in terms of the collector current as a small fraction, where the constant beta is a parameter of the transistor, where um, ideally beta is large. Typical values might be in the range of 50 to 200, just to give you a feel. The emitter current in steady state must obviously equal the sum of the collector and base currents. So just substituting in the simple expression for the base current, we see that we can rewrite the emitter current as uh, this fraction of the collector current, beta being much larger than one. This term here is close to one, but a little bit larger. Um, because the emitter also has to provide that base current. So here's a final expression on the right for the collector current. Sometimes instead of using the constant beta to describe the fraction of current, uh, emitter current that uh, you know is lost to the base, instead we'll sometimes use alpha as a constant 
which is just equal to 1 plus 1 over beta. And again, that's approximately equal to 1. Sorry, this value is 1 over alpha. It's approximately equal to 1, but uh, alpha is a little bit smaller than 1. 1 over alpha is a little bit greater than 1. So that we can write the collector current is alpha times the emitter current. So these equations describe the IV characteristics of the NPN BJT in active mode, where again, the base emitter junction is forward biased and the collector base junction is reverse biased. When using these equations, just note the polarities of the current as they're labeled here. Those are the appropriate polarities for the NPN type BJT. Here we see some circuit models for the NPN type BJT in active mode. Now just note that all four of these models are mathematically equivalent to each other. You can use any one of them in the analysis of any circuit and you should get the right answer. But again, as with other nonlinear devices, you have to be mindful that these models are applicable only when the transistor is in its intended operating mode, in this case, in active mode. So we have to ensure that the collector base junction is um, reverse biased in order for these models to be applicable. Now you see that these models make use of diodes um, to, as a kind of a shorthand for the exponential IV relationship that exists between um, the base emitter voltage and the other currents flowing in the BJT. So if we just look at the first uh, model in the top left, we see that the emitter current is related to the base emitter voltage just by a straight diode equation, right? That is specifically this current IE is IS over alpha times E to the VBE over VT, right? just as if there was a diode connected between base and emitter. And in fact, physically, we know there sort of is. There's this PN junction there. But um, very little of that current actually flows in this terminal. Most of it is collected up here. And that's captured by this um, voltage-dependent current source, where the current IC is given by the expression from the last slide. IS over VBE over VT. So if the collector current equals this expression, the emitter current is uh, governed by this diode equation here, we see that the only, um, the, re the remaining current, the sort of missing current is IB. It's just IE minus IC. And that would in fact be equal to IC over beta if we followed through on all the calculations and substituted in remembering that alpha equals beta over beta plus one. Rather than go through all four models, let's just quickly look at the model in the bottom right. Note that this is just another way to represent the same voltage current relationships. Here in this model in the bottom right, we see diode dB connected between the base and emitter. But in this model, it's the, the diode dB has a much smaller scale current than what we saw in model A in the top left. So that um, the base current IB, right, is given again by diode equation, but now it's, you know, a diode whose scale current is IS over beta, either VBE over VT. So again, in, in agreement with our uh, proper IV equations for um, the BJT. The collector current in this model is uh, expressed as a current dependent current source. So IC is equal to beta times IB, substituting in this expression for IB. We see that the beta is canceled and we just end up with IS e to the VBE over VT again as we expect. So again, no surprise, all the currents are can be calculated and end up being just the same as they were for model A, and in fact, as they would be for model B or C. All the models are, are indeed equivalent. It's just that depending on the circuit configuration, one of these models may provide a little quicker intuition for you. So it's good to, 
uh, have them all in your back pocket. Next, we turn our attention to the PNP BJT in active mode. Um, so the basic principles are all the same. It's just the type of charge carriers is reversed. In this case, because the emitter is P-type, it's mostly holes that are injected from emitter uh, into base carrying the vast majority of the current in this BJT. Those holes diffuse across the narrow base region and are collected by the collector. So most of the current flow here when it's in active mode is holes flowing all the way from emitter to collector, which means positive current flowing into the emitter and out the collector in the opposite direction of the NPN transistor where it was electrons flowing this way. So positive current was flowing that way. So again, um, the other, other main difference here is that because the polarity of the emitter base junction is reversed, the polarity of the base emitter voltage has to be reversed in order to forward bias it. So here you see um, the base is at a lower voltage than the emitter in order to activate the transistor. But again, the principle is the same. It has to be, this junction has to be forward biased. And this one has to be reverse biased, which means the collector in this case has to be at an even lower voltage than the base. Okay. But once you've got the polarities right, then uh, you can see the carriers flow the same way. It's just that the opposite types of carriers. So the base current consists of a few electrons injected across this forward biased junction. Again, it's only a few because the base is not as heavily doped as the emitter. So a few electrons getting injected this way, plus a few electrons to recombine with a few holes uh, as the vast majority of them truck along uh, right on through the base. Okay, so you've got to have some electrons coming into the base to recombine with holes and to go into the emitter. So that means electrons flowing this way, positive current flowing out the base here. So the expressions, the IV uh, relationships are exponential just as they were for the NPN transistor. It's just a game that the polarities, you need to take care with the polarities to make sure that the junctions are forward biased and, and note the polarities of the current are reversed compared to the NPN device. Here are just a couple of circuit models for the PNP BJT in active mode. Um, again, let's just focus on this one, and we see a diode dB um, is used to model the base current that's flowing. It depends exponentially on the forward bias applied between base and emitter, just as a diode current does. But the scale current of this uh, diode in the model is a small scale current, IS over beta, a small fraction of making the base current a small fraction of the current that flows into the collector. The collector current is modeled by a voltage dependent current source with uh, governed by this nonlinear expression, IS e to the power of V EB over VT. So when you see these expressions, right, they, they can be used to find the voltages and currents flowing in BJT circuits, but um, they're not linear. They're still not linear circuit models. Diode equations are nonlinear. These dependent current sources are all governed by nonlinear relationships here. So they're not particularly easy to use. So we're going to develop simpler models to do approximate hand calculations for BJTs uh, later. So I mentioned earlier that the rectangular one-dimensional cartoon sketch of BJTs are not physically how they're actually built. This picture here is closer to the structure of actual BJTs. They're made by starting with a roughly uniformly doped slab or wafer of semiconductor, let's assume silicon. Um, in this case, we're starting with n-type silicon. Uh, and so there's been some donor dopants introduced here. And then th that do those dopants are uh, overwhelmed by a higher concentration of type 3 dopants, um, making a well region within the n-type region that is p-type. And then into that, we introduce 
a smaller region that's very, very heavily doped, again, of the opposite type, uh, in this case, N type for the emitter. So remember, the emitter region is the most heavily doped type of region. You'll also note with this construction that the width of the base region that's relevant is really this dimension here. Because once the emitter emits or injects electrons into the base across this uh, emitter base junction, they only have to diffuse this distance W before they're collected by the collector. Remember, a narrow base width is good if we're looking for a lot of current flow um, through the BJT. Now you'll notice unlike the simple rectangular picture that we're using until now, in this picture the area of the emitter base region is quite different than the area of the base collector region, but it's the emitter base region that is really regulating the current flow in this BJT. So it's the area of the emitter here that is most uh, relevant. So if you imagine looking at the top view of this, right, you'd see, or a 3D view, you've got these wells like this sitting inside each other. So it's really um, this area here that's relevant uh, in determining the kind of current carrying capacity of this BJT, if you like, or the amount of current that will flow for uh, an applied value of VBE. So again, for a large scale current, you'd have a large emitter area and a narrow base region.